Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Ajaz Ahmed and we'll discuss the recent developments in Venezuela and what it portends, the global picture and what I would say is a re-emergence of a certain kind of aggressive regime change operations. Ajaz, there are many peculiarities in the Venezuela situation. The chief of this, of course, is that countries outside uh, what I would call a settler colonial countries, the United States and Canada, and ex-colonial countries like France, uh, Spain, and of course the United Kingdom, deciding who should be the president of an independent country, which of course in this case is Venezuela. Do you find this uh, uh, an attempt to recontour the world? back to a kind of uh, neo-colonial uh, era? The most interesting part of it, um, uh, to supplement what you are saying, is that the this process has been going on for about two years. And Canada has been a part of it since 2017. Uh, that is one uh, major uh, difference that um, the 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 the, the work for the U.S. is being done, uh, was first done with a group of right-wing Latin American countries and Canada fronting as the Lima group, which is very concerned about uh, internal affairs in uh, Venezuela and recognizes this, doesn't recognize that, that sort of thing. So, th so that is the first layer of it. But what is very extraordinary in it, um, in my view, just you know, uh, pertaining to what you were saying, is that there is a there is a global lineup: North America, right-wing regimes of Latin America, which are on the rise after the Pink Tide, as it was called, and all of uh, virtually all of Europe. Western Europe, uh, minus Italy and things like that, virtually all of it. So Europe's inability to stand up to the United States in this flagrant kind of thing, and we'll come to the details of that, that's one side. The other side is Russia, China, South Africa, Turkey, possibly India, so the sort of a rising capitalist countries around the world are on the other side, as is the, uh, the African Union, um, as are the left-wing governments of Latin America. So it's a global divide. Um, the unity of, I mean, the NATO countries plus the Latin American right-wing. Um, that that's one, uh, one you know it's a sort of a global divide like that. Uh, <clears throat> the other very great peculiarity in it is that in the former cases where constitutional mechanisms were used in Brazil and uh, Honduras and so on, they actually were used as constitutional um, procedures. Here, what you have is that. Within two weeks of uh, this appointment of, uh, of Aguedo by uh, Trump and Pence, the whole story comes out in in uh, in, in the Wall, Wall Street Journal. How it was done, who attended which meetings, who made which phone calls to whom, and in this case. You have this young man standing up, declaring himself president after Pence has called him to tell him that he should do so. Trump recognizes him immediately. He makes this announcement as president of the, uh, the National Assembly, which constitutionally in Venezuela is a defunct organization. But anyway, this is there. He doesn't make that statement in, the, in that assembly. That assembly hasn't met. 
He doesn't have a cabinet. It's a self declared presidency. He's not to be seen anywhere. You know, it's a complete self declared presidency. It was so spectacularly constitutional. You know, here, here is the constitutionalist just absolutely the fig leaf. Two years ago, they said, we don't recognize the Constituent Assembly, which, is, which was an elected organ from Lima, in, sitting in Peru, and so on. So it is very much like Diem in Vietnam. You know, you, you just pick up the guy who will work with you. And the, the National Assembly cannot meet because he is not the united candidate of the opposition. He did not even tell his own party that he was going to make this announcement. He's so, I mean, he's so very much transparently a stooge. So that constitutional mechanisms that were used so blatantly, of course, in Brazil and elsewhere, they at least went through all the steps. This is just blatant. Where, I mean, uh, Wall Street Journal breaks the story of how it was done disapprovingly, of how you can do this. This Wall Street Journal telling you the truth of what happened is bizarre. But, uh, but structurally, what you are seeing is a global divide. But you also see a re-emergence of the confidence of, shall we say, the NATO powers to be able to do this in spite of the fact there is opposition both within, of course, within Venezuela, resistance if they have an invasion, which I don't think is likely at this stage. But the fact is, if you talk about the media in the West, the NATO countries, if you talk about the civil society in the NATO countries, there is actually a conspiracy of silence. They are all a part of this larger, shall we say, offensive. Yeah, but it's not even a conspiracy of silence. It's a very strange, um, uh, you know, sitting in the, when you read the American press and so on, the, the, the way they have shifted from one day to the next, it's extraordinary, a month before it happened, New York Times was writing very unhappy stories about what is being planned. And as soon as this it is done, Guido is the leader of the opposition. He can't call the General Assembly because the, the opposition is not united behind him. He comes from a fringe little party. Um, and the, 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 actually the opposition did not, could not um, the could could not participate in the elections because it was so divided so that I, it you know as so that it had no chances. It is equally divided about this Guido boy. As, hmm? as somebody has said, Guido is the Chalabi. If you take Iraq and Chalabi, that this Chalabi is, is a, yes, Chalabi is a more recent yeah. uh, example of that. I my mind went back all the way to Vietnam. To oh. Dien, who was oh. just picked up because he was the only leader of a tiny little thing and made president. Yeah. You, but, know, uh, but you know, in this particular. But uh, the other thing, uh, so, sorry to interrupt you. The other thing, what, I, what I'm seeing actually is not so much confidence as just pure, you know, aggressivity to grab the oil. You know, you're doing it in such a way that you're dividing the globe and uniting so many people against you. Uh, you know, and uh, without a real plan. You know, it so just, far as one can see. It just while that is true, that it doesn't seem to be a long term successful plan because they don't seem to be in a position to invade Venezuela. I think that would be something they're not willing to do as yet. I don't think Brazil and uh, Colombia are willing to be a part of a military invasion also. 
So it seems that he's physically seizing Venezuela, Venezuelan assets, even the oil assets, is going to be not that simple. And if we don't see what they expected, they thought with this there will be really uprising on the streets. That has, doesn't seem to have happened. And it seems that more people have come out in favor of Maduro, in spite of the fact that the global media is very silent on this. But what I am actually interested in looking at, and I, I just wanted to have your sense of this, that there is no also upsurge against this, or in spite of the fact that Wall Street Journal has laid bare what the conspiracy was, but there isn't really the what used to be called the liberal opinion, which would take to streets or take to the media, saying this is not the right way. Appointing a president from the United States and by colonial, ex-colonial powers and settler colonial powers is not really the right way to go about international re relationships, international law. This voice doesn't seem to have been raised. Is that correct well, or am I misreading the situation? Well, I mean, I didn't think there, I don't think there was any great liberal upsurge of opinion in any public way about when they invaded Libya or when they invaded Syria. There was one before they invaded Iraq, but once they invaded, it filtered away. You know, um, th this business of Europe, uh, what I find uh, new now is that Europe got lined up behind it as the conspiracy was being hashed out. That seems to me to be new. Other than that, in the last 40 years, Europe has never defied any decision that the United States has made to overthrow any country. The United States has attempted 68 regime changes in the last 70 years. Europe has never been known to oppose any of them. You know, so that that doesn't surprise me, but that they, uh, they lined up behind the United States and then They've been doing absurd things. You have a week within which to announce elections, otherwise we'll recognize the other guy. <laughs> I mean, they're making themselves ridiculous. But the Western, um, and I must say not only the Western, um, popular, liberal, whatever classes, are politically so quiescent now. Yes. There are no demonstrations against anything the hegemon does. There's an incredible amount of dissatisfaction. So if you start, uh, you know, taking, uh, you know, um, opinion polls, you would get expressions of that, or you go to dissident left-wing media. But it's an, the extreme political passivity, virtual destruction of the public sphere in these countries is very alarming. Yeah, that's that's really the point I wanted yeah. Yeah, to focus sure. on. That in the yeah. context of the Iraq war and the fact that the WMDs were shown to be bogus, the fact that this entire uh, dodgy yeah. dossier, etc., all this which came out later does not seem to have damaged the credibility of, shall we say, the state the United States in this particular case, and its regime change operations of the future. That there's still, all that damage seems to have been very, very transient, and it is solidified again behind the, as you said, the hegemon. Credibility, uh, I don't know if, if there is much credibility uh, of, you know, the, of this, particularly the kind of government the United States now has. It doesn't have credibility about anything at the moment, whether in the United States or anywhere else. Um, so, but, so I see it as a sort of a political cynicism and withdrawal from politics. You know, um, as if the setback of the, that happened in 1989 and, and, and thereafter has wiped 
without the political sphere um, in the West. The, the political parties no longer represent anything. Uh, they no longer are left-wing parties, right-wing parties, social democrats, Christian democrats, and so on. So there is a kind of a, you know, that, so far as that is concerned. Um, but um, about Venezuela, um, the uh, lot of the other, uh, you know, political media is actually very much up in arms. The you know, and not only the media, the National Lawyers Guild uh, has condemned it. The, the, uh, the United Nations Secretary General has said that the UN only recognizes the Maduro government and so on. You know, those kinds of things have happened. Um, but yes, they seem to have a complete license. And a complete control over the global media narrative because that is really controlled by Western news agencies and the news feeds. So, you know, <laughs> sure. yeah. you know, I, you see, I, huh? I look at all of this and the discussion is not whether what the Western governments are doing is right. The discussion is how legitimate is Maduro's government. So that is the narrative that's playing out. Not that whether they can in today's day and age declare themselves as the Roman or the British, shall we say, uh, viceroys or proconsuls in different parts of the world, but the Senate is to appoint or and uh, in the in, in term times of Rome or Britain used to do it as we know in India. Uh, so this kind of imperial overreach is not the narrative. Even in Indian press, the narrative is yeah. how legitimate is the Madhura government. The Indian press, uh, you know, it that narrative hasn't been there. Um, you know, I mean, when the Iran war started, the Indian press, um, newspapers used to uh, to run uh, pictures of all the fancy equipment um, that the U.S. was using, various aircraft, this, that, and the other, very admiringly of, you know, what great technology the United States had, etc. So this is very old stuff. Um, I don't think it's very different. Now, yeah, so of course, you know, it, it has been so. Yeah it's, yeah, it's a change in the media, for instance, 50s, 60s, 70s. Actually, global uh, presence of even third world countries' media representatives used to be there. We had it from India. We had, for instance, uh, correspondents in different parts of the world, including South Africa, including Af other parts of Africa, including even in Latin America. But that has completely changed. Now, entirely the feed comes from Western agencies. 40 years ago, yes, that is true. So this is... So, this, is this, this is not recent. Yeah, so the global narrative they also is something they are able to control. They've Part been able to control it now for a long time. They've controlled the narrative uh, of, you know, the, 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 all the regime changes in the 21st century. They've, they've controlled it completely. So that uh, that has not changed with even the even the delegitimization of the U.S. president, Mr. Trump, has not dented that part of it. it is, this is a this is a state-controlled media. So it doesn't matter who is the president at any given time. It's part of the national security state. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, there's no media left in India or in the United States. And what is also uh, for what may be of surprise to a lot of the other people who don't uh, really, who see this, the other part of it is the social media, the big social media uh, platforms are also very much a part of the security establishment or the security state. Yeah, yeah, yes, most of them, yes. And, and there is a slow destruction of the European media. There's a gradual destruction of the European media. There are still some decent newspapers in Europe, but um, the television and so on um, are going the American way. What is the long-term prognosis, given the fact that there has been at least resistance, as you said, 
in terms of uh, countries like China, Russia, Turkey, uh, this, this kind of lineup that is taking place. Do you think in the long term it's going to make a difference to what happens in Venezuela? Um, this lineup is not going to make, I think, that much difference because the regime of sanctions and appropriations, uh, you know, something like $13 billion of, um, of Venezuelan money has been appropriated already. Um, the UK put, uh, I mean, basically uh, took over uh, the uh, gold deposits of Venezuela two months before this drama. So it's not as if uh, you, they, they even are, there was any ground for it, etc. So the economic hardship is going to be immense. Um, th this is a very classic, in my view, I think the move is very classic. They will starve the population, they'll break the population. They will break the economy. There will be low intensity warfare. It's quite possible that all this money that they're appropriating, some of it will be given uh, nominally to Guido. And uh, maybe a lot of that money would be used to pay for the weaponry, et cetera, et cetera. And there might be some sort of ragtag um, you know, mercenary army um, in Venezuela to start. And it would be supplied from Colombia, uh, uh, Brazil, etc. Informally, many of their officers may join them without announcing it. So there will be a long term um, slow destruction of um, Venezuela. How slow? I'm not very sure, but that's the sort of uh, scenario, uh, the sort of scenario I see, partly because the opposition is still, is not united behind this, uh, this, this joker. And the US has to put all of them together and pretend to bring up a general assembly, form an alternative government, this, that, and the other. Um, this, uh, uh, so my sense is that what has been usual with the United States in this century for the last 20 years is not to risk too many of their own soldiers. There won't be invasion of that type. If the fighting develops to a certain point, then the, the US advisors may go in for 5,000 uh, you know, trainers and advisors, and, you know, that sort of thing, the, the Syrian scenario. Of that sort. So that I think is in the cards. Um, the problem with uh, China and Russia is just the physical distance that breaking an embargo of that magnitude in which Western Europe itself is uh, participating would be just uh, logistically very not feasible. So they won't be able to do much. Uh, they'll do what, what they can, um, but they won't be able to do much. Uh, inside Latin America, the only major country that's on the side of Venezuela is Mexico. And that, that for them, things are very precarious. Uh, also, I mean, this uh, the Trump administration would do anything it can to undermine, you know, that government. So my sense is that you are in for two or three years of low intensity warfare, I don't see an American invasion. Americans are not going to risk their troops in a country in which about there are about six million or so people who fight for their lives. So it's not this the Iraq very, scenario. This will be very serious. This is not Iraq or Syria or something. This is not they the Iraq scenario. About 40% about of the population will fight. So this is not the Iraq scenario, but the Syrian scenario of low intensity war supported from and, arms and from, from the side. From the way, from the side of the Americans. Americans. But, the, but you see, none of these uh, Arab countries 
was the population going to fight? Unlike in, in Venezuela. Venezuela, 40 percent of, of the population will fight for their lives. So the Shabisters, in that sense, are going to, are the difference. Yeah, that's a, that that is that is a very you know. Uh, so Americans are not going to uh, to to put their as they call boots in the ground. Um, okay. you know. Thanks, Ajaz, for being with us, explain, explaining to us the larger context with which this is taking place and the differences between Venezuela and the other countries where regime change has been in operation or has been, in, has been practiced. We will continue to discuss with you this and other issues. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. This is all the time we have for News Click today. Do keep watching News Click and our other programs.